Well, good morning, everyone. So glad that you're here. It's great to be back with you. As Jerry said, my name is Steve Wallen. I'm the campus pastor at our Noblesville campus. And uh, right now, they are doing the very same thing that we're doing, but they're doing it without me. And so I'm glad to be with you again. We're continuing on our series called Sticky Stories. These are stories that maybe you heard as a kid. In fact, we often think of them as kids' stories, but they have lessons that last throughout our entire lives. And uh, we've been giving away these stickers. Maybe you grabbed one of these on your way in. If not, grab one on your way out. And... Uh, How many of you have all of the stickers so far? Anybody? We had some overachievers in the first service. Good for you guys. Way to go. I bet you were the gold star kids in school. You probably got the perfect attendance award uh, when you graduated from high school. That's good for you. Thanks for being here for all of these weeks. And um, I just think these are really cool that we can take these with us and remember, like in this case, we're going to remember God's faithfulness today. And so hopefully you'll grab one on your way out. Uh, The story of Jonah is what we're going to talk about today. If you've got your Bibles, open them to Jonah chapter 1. Uh, This story is a perfect example of one of those stories we often think about as kids' stories. Um, Jonah is near the back of the Old Testament. It's in a section of books called the Minor Prophets. Uh, And we call them minor not because what they teach is unimportant. They're minor prophets because the books are short. That's all that, that means. And so if you look at major prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, they might have 50 or 60 chapters, and then there's poor Jonah there with only four. Um, But that doesn't mean it's less important. Uh, If you open your Old Testament right to the middle and then go to the right, you'll find Jonah back there. That's all the direction I can give you. I'm sorry. I don't have a page number for you. Uh, But Jonah's story is a famous one. In fact, even if you didn't grow up in church, maybe you've never read your entire Bible, there's probably one thing you know about Jonah, and it's what? Got eaten by a fish or a whale. We don't know uh, one or the other. That's what's on the sticker as well. In fact, um, I bet that's the one thing that you know. Now, some of you may have written off this story because of the ridiculousness of that. Right? It's ridiculous that somebody could be eaten by a whale. But did you see this video that went viral back in June of these two kayakers that were eaten by a whale? That is crazy. These guys were on a whaling expedition, found one. Um, they were on a whaling expedition, and they had apparently, all these uh, folks in the kayaks and on paddle boards had um, kind of chummed the water with fish, and the whale found them and came up and took Now, fortunately, these two kayakers weren't hurt. That's uh, an incredible ordeal to go through, but they, did not, they were not injured. There was one man, though, in history who was not quite as lucky. His name was James Bartley, and he was right, widely reported by several newspapers in 1891 as to having been swallowed whole by a sperm whale and lived in his stomach for 36 hours until he was accidentally found by some whalers. The story goes like this. It's first reported in the St. Louis Democrat. Bartley had been a part of a whaling crew whose boat was attacked by a whale. Bartley, as part of that attack, was swallowed by this whale. The whaling crew continued on their journey, found this whale, not knowing it was the same whale, killed it, started to skin it. And as they did, not knowing that their former sailing compatriot was in the stomach, they tore it open and out popped their buddy, uh, James Bartley. He was there. Now, reports say that Bartley's skin was bleached from the whale's gastric juices and that he was blind for the rest of his life. Not quite as fortunate as their two kayaker friends on the screen. Now, in Jonah's case... It's true that the fish uh, is the most famous part of the story, and even though we've included that as the graphic on our sticker, we're going to spend less time on that than we do any other part of Jonah's story, because frankly, I think it's the least interesting part of his story. There are far greater lessons, and in fact, because of the absurdity of him being swallowed by a fish, living there for three days and being spit back up, uh, a lot of scholars think that this story may actually be allegory, not historical fact. What we do know is it's not a parable. A parable is a story with made-up characters. It's a made-up story with made-up characters. We know Jonah is not a made-up character. He's an actual prophet of God. We see him in other places in Scripture. And in fact, we think Jonah is probably the author of this story because the author seems to know details that no one else would know. Um, So let's dive in and see what we can learn. We're going to start at the very beginning of the story, Jonah 1.1. If you've got your Bibles open there, if not, it'll be on the side screens, or if you're watching online, it'll be down here. Um, It says this, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, Nineveh was not a part of the kingdom of Israel, but this doesn't seem like an unreasonable ask for Jonah. After all, Jonah is a prophet. The job of a prophet is to bring the word of God to people who don't necessarily want to hear it. We see him doing that. 
uh, throughout Scripture. In fact, in 2 Kings 14, he, he prophesied to King Jeroboam II. Um, but something is stopping Jonah from taking on this assignment. We'll see in verse 3. It says, But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now, there's an interesting phrase here right at the beginning of verse 3 that says, But Jonah ran away from the Lord as if you could run from a God who's everywhere, right? How could you get away from the Lord? In fact, uh, here's how King David wrote it in Psalm 139. He said, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I, I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Now, the implication in that is that we can't run away from God. But Jonah's going to try. He's called to go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh is east of Israel uh, in modern-day Iraq. You can see it on this map here. Jonah's going to start at point A, if you can see that. He's called to go to point B, which is Nineveh, kind of north and east, like I said, in modern-day Iraq. And instead, Jonah's going to hop on a ship and try to sail to Tarshish, which is over on the far right side of the map there, all the way west in Spain, probably near Gibraltar, and he's going to try to get, in fact, he's going to try to get as far as west is from the east from the Lord. He's running away from God. That's what he's going to do. Um, but he can't get away that easily. We'll see. Verse 4 says this, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. The Lord sent a strong wind. And this is a theme we're going to see a couple of times throughout the story of Jonah, this theme of the wind from the Lord. And it brought up for me, as I read this, a lot of questions about would the Lord cause a storm? Would the Lord cause something bad to happen? I mean, these sailors are in danger because of the storm that the Bible clearly says is from the Lord's creation, it's from God's creation. Um, would he do that just to get Jonah's attention? Well, Yes, but not before Jonah was disobedient, right? I mean, Jonah's disobedient is what caused the storm. The Lord sent it, but Jonah's disobedience, and God gave him a way out, and the way out was obedience. So the sailors look around this storm, and it very quickly becomes apparent to them, this is not just a normal storm, like a weather storm. There is something supernatural about what's happening in this storm, and so they all start praying. They start praying to their own gods. They start asking the passengers on board, hey, who's your God? Go pray to your God. Go pray to your God. They can't find Jonah. Jonah's nowhere to be found. He's below deck sleeping, taking a deep nap. They wake him up. They say, Jonah, who is your God? Which God do you worship? And this is how he said, answers in Jonah 1.9. He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And this terrifies the sailors. See, in most of the cultures in those days, they would have had multiple gods. They would have had a god that created a god of the sea and a god of the land and a god of the wind and a god of the storms. And to hear that there was potentially one god who was capable of creating all of these things, well, this kind of sets them on edge. Um, and so uh, this terrifies them. And so they say, hey, uh, why don't you pray to your god? Go pray to that God who created all these things. But Jonah has another solution. Verse 12, this is what he says. Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Now, this gives us our first clue as to maybe why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh in the first place, and that's that he hates the Ninevites. These guys are savages. They're heathens? We don't know. Is he being racist here? Is he being self-righteous? Is he, is he being both? We don't know. I don't know. But what I do know is he'd rather die than see God have mercy on these people. I mean, they say, why don't you pray to your God? And instead he says, just throw me overboard. I'd rather you throw me overboard than pray to that God, right? And so that's what they do. <laughs> they throw Jonah overboard, but not before they throw out a bunch of cargo because before Jonah confessed, they didn't know what was going on here. They think we got to lighten the ship so it doesn't break apart. They start throwing packages overboard. So they've got all this cargo that's bound for Tarshish. Somebody in Tarshish is not going to get their Amazon package because of Jonah's disobedience. You know, and it's a great reminder to me as I read this that our disobedience and our sin affects other people. 
and sometimes even people we don't know. And so here's where Jonah is swallowed by the giant fish or whale. We don't know. It doesn't matter. And he stays there for three days and three nights. But as a Bible-believing Christian, we should believe that this actually happened. And if for no other reason than that Jesus referred to this story while he was alive. In fact, he kind of used it as a prediction that he himself would be in the grave for three days and then would be raised. Uh, Which brings to mind the question, is this story supposed to be history or is it prophecy? In other words, is it a description of something that actually happened or is it a prediction of something that was going to happen in the future? And I think as I read through this, the answer is yes, it's both. It's both history It tells us something that happened, and it's prophecy uh, predicting something that's going to happen in the future. It's a messianic prophecy or a prophecy about Jesus. So uh, just like a parent who makes a child go to their room to think about what they've done, uh, God sends Jonah into the belly of this fish where he stays for three days and three nights. He's in a nice, dark, quiet place with time to think. And after three days of that, Jonah eventually relents. Now, notice I said relents and not repents. Uh, is there's, there's a difference here, and you'll see the difference here in a minute. He gives this really great heartfelt prayer. In fact, if you read Jonah 2, Jonah 2 is all of Jonah's prayer to the Lord, and this is how it ends. It ends like this, Jonah 2, 8 says, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good, and I will say salvation comes from the Lord. He basically says, Lord, I'm going to do what you told me to do. And verse 10 tells us, and the Lord commanded the fish and vomited Jonah onto dry land. Now, that doesn't sound like the most pleasant experience to me, and maybe it doesn't to you. But did you know that whales in their digestive tract actually produce a substance that's very valuable on earth, uh, on, on land? It's called ambergris, and it's produced in the digestive system of whale, and it was used in the last century a lot to make perfume. Uh, It's been largely replaced by chemicals now, as many things have, synthetic chemicals, but it actually has a pleasant, floral, earthly, earthy scent to it. But Jonah did not come out smelling like a rose. You like that? You like what I did there? Okay, well, it's the last time I have to say that line. What we'll see from reading this story is that despite his heartfelt prayer, Jonah's heart was not really changed at all by this incident of being swallowed by a fish. And that's unusual, I think, because I really think this is one of those moments in Jonah's life that he's going to remember. (laughs) I think it's one of those moments, in fact, that he'll probably divide his time into before and after. Do you know what I mean? Many of us have one of those moments in our lives. Maybe it was a sickness. Maybe it was an accident. It's a time where you think about any event that happened in your life and you think, you know what? That was before the cancer, right? That was after the crash. That was before he died. And I think for Jonah, that's one of those moments. My friend in high, my best friend in high school, um, we were good friends from sixth grade on through high school. And then when he was 19, um, he was driving back from Ball State University late at night, fell asleep at the wheel of his car, crashed into the back of a parked pickup truck at 50 miles an hour, flew through the windshield, hit the cab of the pickup truck, and landed in the bed. And it was a couple of hours before anyone found him. And when they took him to the hospital, he was paralyzed from the neck down, couldn't move, couldn't feel. It took him a few days to even get feeling back in his feet and his toes. It took him several weeks to learn to stand again and many, many months to learn to walk again. But even when he did, even when he learned to walk, eventually he always had a limp. And now it's 35 years later almost, and he still, every event in his life is still that happened before the accident or that happened since the accident. And I think for Jonah, this would have been one of those moments that he marked time in his life. That was before the fish. This was after the fish. But even so, his heart was unfazed. We see uh, in Jonah 3, verse 1, the story continues. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. In fact, we see it wasn't just the people of Nineveh who repented, it was the leadership as well. Uh, The the verse 4 goes on, 
or verse 6 goes on, when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. What we see is this king mourning over how far the Ninevites had come from God. This is great, right? This is exactly what God wanted to happen, and it's exactly what Jonah feared would happen. In fact, every indication that we have in Scripture is that Jonah did this one day of ministry and then gave up, that he didn't go any further. He didn't even finish the job that he was given by God to do. Remember, this city, Nineveh, is a three-day walk across this city. Jonah goes in, preaches for one day, sees the people start to turn back to God, and then he gives up and goes home. In fact, he doesn't go home, but no matter, somehow the unrepentant prophet got the people to repent. Verse 10 says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. God makes a new covenant with the people of Nineveh, and this makes Jonah angry But before we go all off on Jonah for his self-righteousness, maybe we need to look at ours for a minute because we're always fans of God's mercy when it's applied to us, but not always when it's applied to others that we don't think deserve it. I mean, how often have you heard about a celebrity that comes to Christ, a celebrity that makes a proclamation of Jesus, and you think, I don't think that's real. I've seen her movies. I've read his lyrics. That's not a real thing. That Jesus thing, that's not real. They're just using that. Or how often do we hear of someone who's put in prison for a horrible crime and then on death row or uh, before their trial, they, they find Jesus and they make this proclamation and we're like, I don't believe it. I don't think that, I don't think that really happened. Uh, we see, something in us desperately wants to believe we have a God who changes hearts while simultaneously holding on to the idea that some people are completely immune from that change. Right? We, we want a God who can change our heart, but we're not quite sure he can change yours. Author, the late author Eugene Peterson said it this way. He said, I take it as a given that all of us would prefer to be our own God than to worship God. Well, so here's how it affects Jonah. We see verse 4. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong that the people were turning back to God, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't that what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sin and calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Now, this reminds me of another story in Scripture. It's a story from the New Testament, one that Jesus told about a man who had two sons. And one of these sons, uh, who was young and exuberant, asked for his inheritance early. And he left his father and his brother, and he went out into the world, and he spent it all on women and wine and food. And uh, in his compulsiveness, he got rid of every last dime, and he was forced to go crawling back to his father, begging for mercy And he came crawling back, ready to tell this whole story and to ask for forgiveness. And his father, ever compassionate, ran to his son when he saw him coming down the road. And he threw his arms around him and hugged him and threw him a party. But all the time, this older brother, who had always been obedient, was standing over in the corner watching this thing with crossed arms and pursed lips and tapping his foot and thinking, this just isn't right. This just isn't right. I've been here the whole time. And here comes this guy back into the picture, right? He didn't believe his brother deserved a second chance. What he didn't count on was that his father was gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in love. Friends, we have a God of second chances. Look at how this God responds to Jonah, verse 4-4. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? What a great question, isn't it? Was it right for Jonah to be angry because things didn't go his way? Because things went God's way instead of his own way? Uh, Was it appropriate for him to be upset or discouraged that other people had found their way back to God? I mean, didn't God have a right to save whomever he wanted to save? This is a great question to ask yourself whenever you're mad at God. Is it right for me to be angry? 
Is it right for me to believe that God should have done things my way, or is he free to do things his way? Well, Jonah needs to think about this question for a while, and so he wanders off. He wanders off into the desert, into the hot desert, and finally, eventually, he lands uh, under this plant. He finds this plant. This plant had kind of sprung up out of nowhere, and he decides to sit under it because it provides great shade. In fact, the Bible says that God provided this plant for Jonah to ease his discomfort. I love this. Even in his bitterness, God is kind to him. Even in his unrepentance, God is merciful and faithful. He allows Jonah to be comfortable in his discomfort. He's pouting. He's hiding from his people. He's hiding from God. How often do we get comfortable in our discomfort? We we get caught in a pattern of sin or a habit or something, and it seems so right and so familiar, and it allows us to ignore God. Because, yeah, we're uncomfortable, but we're comfortable in our discomfort. Now, Jonah loves this plant so much, and why? Well, it allows him to ignore God. He, for a while, can be comfortable in his discomfort, and so God kills it. Again, he sends a wind. Uh, This is, again, we see the hot wind. But, by the way, God will often kill things in our lives that are acting as idols, Right? He kills this plant, and uh, this time a scorching hot wind that burns up the plant. Well, this story ends pretty abruptly with one more exchange between God and Jonah. Uh, verse 9, chapter 4, verse 9 says, But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Again, Jonah's angry. He's, he's angry that God saved these people. He's angry that the plant got burned up. Jonah says, It is, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. He said, and should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left? Here's what I want to take away from today. So often we use these stories as a mirror, right? We hold it up to our face and we say, where where do I see myself in this story? You know, and in this case, Jonah is just uh, blatantly disobedient, and uh, we can't really learn anything from that, right? Uh, <laughs> no, we, we hold it up and we go, am I Jonah? Like, is there something I'm angry about? Is there something I'm upset about, bitter about? Uh, am I being stubborn? Am I being disobedient? Am I ignoring God's plan? But instead, today, I, I want to use this story not as a mirror to see ourselves in it, but can we use it as a window, a window into the character of of God, to to see him better. And there's one thing, as I looked at it this way over the past couple weeks, there's one thing that became apparent to me, very obvious as I read this story again this week, and it's this. God is faithful even when we're not. Well, what does that mean? Well, Joan is concerned about his own life and his own comfort, while God is concerned about the people in this large city. Jonah, whose very job it is to bring the word of God to people who need it, is unrepentant and disobedient, and God is going to remain faithful even when Jonah isn't. Jonah is angry at God's mercy. He doesn't want God to rescue his enemies. This is why he ran away. This is why he quit after one day. This is why he pouted like a toddler after the people found their way back to God. This is why he went to Tarshish in the first place. And it's the same reason why we sometimes run from God. It's the same reason why followers of Jesus. It's the same reason why we don't always share our story of Jesus with other people who need to hear it. We don't want to get involved in those messy disciple-making relationships because we know that people are messy and they have messy stories and that mess is not going to stay in their story. It's going to come into our story and take over our lives. We'd rather go to Tarshish than go to Nineveh. But again, Eugene Peterson, I think he puts this so beautifully. He says, Tarshish is a dream a vision, a goal. Nineveh is mappable. It has dust and dirt in the streets. It's full of the kind of people you don't particularly want to spend the rest of your life with. You know, in a way, we're all a little bit like Jonah. We, we gravitate towards people who look like us, who talk like us, who, who vote like us, who were born in the same country as we were, and that's exactly the problem. But see, God is not like this. He created each and every one of us. And the Bible says that he desires that everyone would find their way back to him. In fact, 2 Peter 3 says it this way, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 
This is so much a part of his character that he didn't just talk about it. He did something about it. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. His son Jesus came to earth to seek and to save those who were lost. And Romans 3.23 reminds us that's all of us. It says that not one person, that we all fall short of the glory of God. But because of his great mercy, John writes, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, all of us have the right to become children of God. I love author and podcast Tara Lee Cobble, podcast host Tara Lee Cobble. Uh, she says it this way. She says, since God himself isn't confined to a body, and we're all made in his image, then there's something in every single person that has a point of connection for him. So he spreads out his love to people from among every nation. I want to think about it this way. Every person you've ever met is someone that Jesus went to the cross for. You know, you've never met anyone he didn't die for. You've never been angry at anyone Jesus didn't die for. You've never argued online with anyone that Jesus didn't die for. You've never been cut off in traffic by someone who Jesus didn't die for or cut someone off in traffic who Jesus didn't die for. You've never been married to anyone Jesus didn't die for. You've never dated anyone Jesus died for. You've never been flipped off by or cussed out by someone that Jesus didn't die for. He gave up his life for all of us. That's the God we serve. He's faithful even when we're not. And Jonah doesn't like this. When They believed and repented. God made a covenant with the people of Nineveh. And Jonah's clearly mad because God chose to adopt his enemies into God's own family. But for my sake, I'm really glad this is in the character of God because I was once an enemy of God. You know, I was on my own path to Tarshish. But but while I was still a sinner, God sent his son to rescue me. That's what he's done for you too. Just like the people of Nineveh, God has made a covenant with us. Now, a covenant is a promise. It's a way of making people who aren't actually family into family, and God did that for us. Most of us are not a part of the original nation of God. We're not of the Jewish origin, but God, by his own action, not from anything that we did, he graciously, intentionally made us into part of his family. He's a good father. He's a wonderful savior. He's a faithful God. Let's give him thanks for that today. Would you pray with me? Father, I'm thankful for the story of Jonah and what it can teach us about you. God, we are so sorry for the times that we're not faithful and so thankful that you are always faithful. You are always who you said you are. You always do what you promised you would do. You are always the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And God, while our desires are fleeting and our character kind of changes with the wind. You are a steadfast God who is always faithful. Whether we are or not, we're thankful for that. We're thankful what the story of Jonah teaches about us, but more than that, what it teaches us about you. And so God, as we just come to you, even the next few minutes, for those of us who are children of yours, would you just remind us once again how faithful you are? And Lord, for people in this room that maybe have never made that decision, that they've never decided to follow you, they don't know what a relationship with you is like. Maybe over the next few minutes, you would just speak to them through this song and as we wrap up our service and remind them that you are here and that you are faithful. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name.